No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for, the one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic Law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. If you're able, please stand and worship with us. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. And my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your She's over. 
So I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. Great. You all can have a seat. Easter. All right. Hey, I'm Joe Boudreau. Uh, my wife and I, Carol, we uh, facilitate the Stepping Stones class here. We have that about three or four times a year. Um, so if you're new to the church, you want to learn more about what we do, why we do what we do, and what we believe, uh, that's a great class to be able to do that. And normally, my wife makes brownies, so I'm just saying, and they're pretty good. Um, you don't want me to make them brownies. All right. Hey, in the seat pocket right in front of you, there's a card. Uh, some of them, there's, uh, it's got two sides to it. Most of them do. Some of the old ones have got one side. So if you pick one up, you know, if you don't know what he's talking about, well, I do. So if you look at it, there's on one side, it's a prayer card. So anything that you want us uh, as a church to pray about, just write it on this card. Now, you don't need us to pray for you. You've got a direct line to our Savior. You can pray for yourself. But if you want us to pray for you, we'll be glad to do it. Corporate worship, corporate prayer is all very important. Put whatever you want on here, as much or as little information as you want, whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, on the other side, it's called the Connect Card. Uh, some of the things that are on the Connect Card have a lot of things to do with what we're talking about in our Stepping Stones class, our Partners class, we call it. Um, there's things in there about if you're new to the church, you want to learn more, join a small group. Uh, if you want to become baptized, we've got Baptism Sunday coming up. Um, we do that after you're saved, right? Very important. Uh, I want to become a partner. I'm ready to be a volunteer. We've got a great missions team. Uh, a lot of different missions we have, both in, inside the church and outside the church. Uh, and most importantly, if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So some people ask me why we, uh, when Chris asked us to do the partnership class, why we said absolutely. Well, the reason is that I'm 25 years old. Okay? So people go, you're not 25. My goodness, right? Uh, hey, I'm 25 because that's when I gave my life to Christ. I was born again 25 years ago. So, and that's one of the reasons we do that, right? I've, I'm obviously a lot older than that. And I would hope that there's more people that find Christ at a younger age and not go through the crap, and I'll use the word crap, that I went through before I was saved. There's a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. I mean, I knew what sin was for sure, 
and I thought there was no end to it. And there's no way for me to ever know if I was going to go to heaven or not. And we know when we read the Bible and we do what the Bible says and we believe what the Bible says, we know that if we give our lives to Christ, at that moment we know that we will be in heaven. There's no doubt about it, okay? No doubt about it. It's not about works, right? It's about a free gift. So we talk about that. We talk about sin in the in this class. Um, people say, well, what is sin? Sin's missing the mark. Well, whose mark? God's mark. The Bible says all have sinned. So some people don't want to hear that. Some people want, hey, I'm not that bad. I know I'm better than so-and-so, right? It has nothing to do with anybody else. It has to do with what Jesus said, what God says about if you're a sinner or not. And we're all sinners, right? But there's good news. There's awesome news, right? You're, you're all set. If you can admit that you're a sinner, then you know what the next step is. You need a Savior. You need someone to save you for your sins. So we talk about that in there. A lot of biblical references in the class. Um, so get comfortable reading your Bible. I hope that that's a journey that you guys are on. Uh, the other thing that we talk about, we talk about sin. We also talk about tithing or giving. Right? Oh, my gosh. Giving? Really? Money? Seriously? We're going to talk about money? So the way we look at, the way that we, Milestone Church, actually look at giving is that it's part of your spiritual journey. It's a way that we worship. Just like when we sing and we pray, how we treat other people, giving is all part of that. So that may be one of your strongholds. Ah, I'm not giving that up. Well, I'm sure Jesus, God's working on you on that one, right? Because it's about worship. So if you decide that you want to give, we've got a bunch of different ways to give. You can actually text 84321 on your mobile phone and give that way. You can go on the app. hope everybody's got the app, Church Center app. Uh, you can give that way. Uh, we set up our recurring giving that way. Uh, kiosk, it's over by the door. Uh, it's an iPad on a stick. It's a fancy word for kiosk, but that's where it is. Um, we got a website, milestonechurch.cc, uh, or the old-fashioned way, cash or check. There's a box back here by the sound booth or one by the front door. So let me go ahead and pray. Lord, thank you just so much for Easter. Thank you for finishing the work that you started. That you would save a sinner like me, that I know if I were to die, I know exactly where I would be. I'd be in your arms, just praising you and thanking you for what you've done for me and what, you did, what you've done for a lot of people in this room. I pray that if there's anybody in here that, that doesn't know, that they get that straight they know that, that they can trust you because you are faithful and you are good and you just love us so much. I pray that you would bless these tithes and these offerings that we receive and use them to, to further your kingdom, to be able to create, create those environments where people far from God can be filled with life in Christ. We love you, Lord. Bless this day. Amen. If you're able, why don't you stand to your feet again with us? Join us, giving our praise to the Lord this morning. Hope you sing. Praise the Lord.
You guys can take a seat again. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Amen. Amen. He's risen. Amen. Amen. Welcome today to Milestone Church. Uh, I'm so excited to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Chris Bumblow, and I'm the pastor here, and uh, I just wanted to say right off the bat, just want to let everybody know, um, I broke my finger this past week playing basketball, okay? My oldest son looked at me and said, Dad, stop it, you're old. And I said, well, if it isn't the wind beneath my wings. Uh, now, so I just want to let you know, because everybody's asking me, like, what happened to your finger? That way I don't have to tell everybody individually. Uh, I broke it playing ball. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, you know, um, I just wanted to share... Easter is a big deal, you know, and, and in Tennessee culture, in Southern culture, uh, we all go out and buy, uh, most people go out and buy Easter clothes, you know, uh, and you're welcome here, and I want you to know that God loves you no matter if you have new Easter clothes on or not, all right? It doesn't matter. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah, let's, let's have a round of applause for that. Um, and that's either way. I think some of y'all look beautiful in your new Easter clothes, and you know, I went through a lot of seasons in my life where I didn't have money to get new Easter clothes, and God loves me anyway. Praise God. He loves you just the same. Um, but So I say all that to say this. My wife was like, this week, she's like, I'm going to go buy the kids some pretty new Easter clothes. And I was like, great, whatever. Hey, knock it out, you know. And she was like, uh, are you going to get any? And I was just like, honey, I don't need to give God my clothes because I've given him my heart. She's like, shut up. She doesn't fall for the spiritual card anymore. However, I was going to wear my Not Today Karen shirt. Um, but she made me wear this pastel green for Easter, so we have Ron Foster, Sandra. Uh, no, but we're glad to have you here. Uh, if you're a visitor, I hope that you feel welcome here. I hope you feel the love of the Lord today. Um, the heartbeat of our church here uh, is to create environments where those far from God can be filled with life in Christ. That's why we do everything we do, and so I'm grateful for you being here today. I'm grateful for all those watching online with us. Uh, we thank God for you as well. Um, and, you know, we're landing our series today. We've been building up to this. It's, it's the crescendo of the series we've been doing called The Fall Guy. Uh, and, and The Fall Guy was about how Jesus took the fall so we could rise. And so week one, um, we talked about the fall of man. Week two, we talked about the blood of Jesus. Week three, we talked about the cross. And today is the exclamation point, uh, the crescendo, all right, the big moment. This is the resurrection that changes everything uh, in our life. Because I don't know if you ever thought about it, but if we stopped at the cross, that's not good news. If he was still in the tomb, it's not good news. Like the resurrection changes everything. Um, so if you'll pray with me, we're going to dive in today. And I pray that God would be honored uh, and that we would be changed. Father God, we come to you right now. We thank you for this moment. 
Thank you for every person in this room. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts today, God, that my words would be your words, that, Father, you would uh, touch lives, that those that do not know you would find life in you today. Uh, Those that do know you but maybe are holding things back, God, they would open their hands to you and allow you to breathe life into every area of their life. Um, God, most of all, may we take one step closer to you, whatever that step looks like. It's different for each of us on our journey, um, but whatever it is, God, may we take one step closer to you on this Resurrection Sunday. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm a, I'm a nerd, okay? I just want to start with that. I'm a nerd. I'm a reader. I read a lot, okay? I know it's a foreign art to a lot of people, um, but I also read. I'm an ADHD reader. Is anybody, anybody, anybody else an ADHD reader? Okay, so like I read six books at a time, but I never finish any of them. You know what I'm saying? And if you're one of those people who feels like you have to finish a book once you started it, I need to set you free. All right, because not every book is worth finishing. Some books are only have one good chapter. All right, but I'm, that's neither here nor there. So I say that to say um, my favorite book actually is the Bible. I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor. I'm saying that because it's changed my life. And, and when I read the Bible, uh, I'm just going to be real with you, okay, transparent. Sometimes I read the Bible, and I'm like, what did I just read, right? Like, like there's some wild stories in the Bible. There's some stuff that's kind of weird, different, you know, and it's like, it's like, wow. And so I was like, how awesome would it be to start Easter with one of the, my favorite weird stories in the Bible, all right? Like, and so that's what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to talk about this vision. There's this weird guy in the Old Testament named Ezekiel, all right? And he was a weird cat, and it is proof that God can use anybody, all right? He uses weird people, nerds. He can use anybody, okay? Um, and so this guy was a prophet, and he was a different cat. And so the Holy Spirit took him out and gave him a vision out in the desert. He's out in this desert, and he's looking around, and there's all these dry bones, just dead bones laying everywhere. And I wish I could have been there to see his response. You know, God asked him a question, and he says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he, exa- he answered like I would. I mean, it's like, Lord, only you know, right? Like, that, that's a God question, right? Like, I don't know. I just see a bunch of dead, dry bones. And so he's looking around, and all of a sudden, God says, okay, Ezekiel, I want you to speak to the bones. Now, some of y'all church folk right then, you'd have walked off. This is weird. I'm out of here, all right? Yeah, I didn't sign up to be speaking to no bones in the middle of a desert. But he says, I want you to speak to these bones. And he's like, okay. So he talks to the bones, and he says, hear the word of the Lord. And all of a sudden, they start rattling and cracking. And they start coming together. They start, pop, 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 pop. they start creating a skeleton. And then the next thing you know, tendons start coming on them and flesh coming on them. And they're standing up. And like right about then, it would have been either freaky scary or freaky awesome. I'm not really sure which one yet, if I had visually seen it. Um, but it would make an epic sci-fi movie, would it not? Like I would watch it in theater, okay? Um, but... So it's all coming together, and so then you got these, like, bodies standing, and and God tells me, he says, but they don't have breath. So he says, speak to the breath, and he said, all right, breath, hear the word of the Lord. And so the breath comes in, and, and boom, there's this army of living, breathing people standing from the word of the Lord. And I started to think about it, like, this is a really cool, weird story, but I started thinking, like, so many of us today, we really can identify with that vision, can we not? Like so many times in our life, I feel like we feel like dead, dry bones. And I know like before Christ, I remember feeling, um, I remember feeling hopelessness and shame and like why can't I stop doing what I don't want to do and, and why can't I do what I want to do? And I felt powerless and I remember hurting people, uh, saying things I didn't mean to say, doing things I didn't mean to do. And I remember the weight and all the, and the, the guilt and the crushing of it and like, And I felt dead and dry and hopeless in a lot of ways. And maybe you're here and maybe yours is something different. Maybe your marriage feels dead. Maybe you're like right now, you're like, well, that is my marriage to a T. Dead bones on the valley floor. Maybe you feel like it's your relationship with your children. Maybe you haven't talked in years. Uh, Maybe you feel like it's dead and dried out and there's no hope for it. Maybe it's a job that you loved and you lost it and, and, and it feels dead. Or maybe it was a dream you had for your life, like you had the path that you dreamed for your life, and then life took you this way, all right? And maybe you're in mourning over that. And so I think the question I really want to bring to us today is like, what do we do when we feel dead and dry like these bones? Like, how can we be made alive? And so that's what I want to talk about today. And if you're with me, say, I am. All right, we're going to look at this and... uh, 
We're going to look at the scriptures, one of my favorite stories. This is John chapter 11, and this is when Jesus, his best friend Lazarus, has died. All right, so check this out. John chapter 11, and it says in verse 17, When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus, one of his best friends, had already been in his grave for four days. So th he died and has been in the grave four days. He's dead. Not partially dead. He's all the way dead. Okay, like he's dead dead. All right. And so Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. And many of the people had come to console uh, Martha and Mary in their loss. That was his sisters. They were heartbroken. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming... She went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house, probably because she's mad at Jesus for not being there. That's, I'm, I'm thinking that. It's not in Scripture. That's what I read into it. Um, but she stayed back. You go talk to him then. I'm mad right now. Um, verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, like, where were you? And he says, yes, or, or he says he would have not died in verse 22. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. And she says, yes, I know he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And she's talk, she thinks he's talking about the end of time uh, when all the believers were. He's like, no, no, Martha, you're not getting it. You're not getting what I'm trying to tell you. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Like all the power you need is right here. All right. Like it's before you, you have no clue. Like you have no clue. It's all right here. All right. Like he's trying to tell her. Um, and he's like, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? That's a key thing to underline in your Bible. Do you believe this, Martha? She says, yes, Lord. She told him, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. So the word Messiah meant Savior. He was coming to save his people from their sin. And so this is a lot, a lot of meat here, but I want to pull out two points um, that I want to pull out two points that will change your life if you allow them to really sink into your heart. And if you're taking notes, you want to write this down. Number one is this: Jesus said, "I am the resurrection and the life. Only Jesus has the power to bring dead things to life." So you may look around and see death in your life. There's only one place that can bring life to that. No. No matter how far the relationship has gone, only Jesus can bring life into that. Okay? No, no matter how far the addiction, the struggle, uh, the depression, the anxiety, the financial debt, only Jesus can bring you out of that, can bring healing and breathe life into this situation. Only Jesus can awaken your soul. Only Jesus can restore your marriage. Only Jesus can heal your kids. Only Jesus can give you hope and dreams again. 1 John 5.12, I love this. John is like straight, simple, like to the point. He doesn't beat around the bush. He says, whoever has the Son has life. Mic drop. You want life in your life? Have Jesus. Like he just, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. He doesn't pull any punches. He speaks very clearly. He says, Jesus brings life. His message changes everything. He turns defeat into triumph, all right? Everywhere that Jesus walks, life follows. All right? So Jesus is the key to bringing life in the middle of your dead things. Here's the second point. The two most powerful words anyone could ever say, I believe. I believe. When those two words are spoken and they're, and they're placed in the right person, it can change everything you ever thought you knew. The whole world changes. Everything changes. Um, and, and we need to understand this. You know, Mary, when he was talking to Martha, she was like, I believe, Lord. I believe. I've always believed. Like, like that was the test. And I want you to know something today. As you look around in your dead, dry bones in your life, whatever it is in your situation, a lot of you probably have things in your mind right now like, yeah, that for sure. That, yeah, that. Listen, whatever it is, I want you to know that the only person that can believe for you is you. It doesn't matter what your parents believe. It doesn't matter what your grandparents believe. It doesn't matter what your friends believe. It doesn't matter what your spouse believes. It doesn't matter what your, your co-workers believe. Only what you believe. Because if you don't believe, that life will not enter in. Does that make sense? 
So we see this in Matthew 16. It says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he said, who do the people say that I am? And well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he said, well, who do you say that I am? You. Personal. You. Where are you placing your faith at? Do you believe? And so that's the question is, do you believe today? Because that's what matters. And maybe you're here today and you say, well, Chris, why should I believe? Like, what difference does the resurrection really make? Like, why should I believe? Well, I'm going to give you four reasons I believe you should believe in the resurrection. If you're taking notes, I ask you to write these down. But more importantly, I pray that God would write these on your heart. If you're still with me, say, I am. All right, here we go. Why should I believe the resurrection? Number one, the resurrection breathes new life into your soul. It changes our desires at the root. All right, now catch this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Amen? Now listen, I want to speak to you from my experience. I'm going to tell you, everybody has a different experience, um, different details. But listen, I'm going to tell you this. When I became a new creation, all my struggles didn't go away. All my stress didn't go away. It wasn't all unicorns and butterflies. Um, But you know what did change immediately was my desire to follow Jesus, to learn more about him, and to honor him. And I didn't understand everything. I didn't understand all the different things that people talked about. But I just knew I wanted to do what was right, and I wanted to honor him. And that is the transformative work that happens when we put our faith in the resurrection, when it comes in our life. And the scripture calls it this. The scripture, the scripture says this. Ezekiel 36 says, And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's uh, when, we, when we have the Holy Spirit come into us and we put our faith in the resurrection, it's a whole new life. It's a new heart. It's a new spirit. The resurrection changes us. Now, honestly, I want to say this. The resurrection will transform us. Some people, it's instantly. Some people are like, I was an alcoholic for 40 years and I got saved and I've never drank again. That's rare. That's not the norm. But it happens. Some people, it happens faster. Some people, it happens slower. But the bottom line is it happens. Okay? We're all different. We're all on different journeys. We all have different personalities and different battles. But the Holy Spirit begins its transforming work in our life, and it will begin to change us. And baptism is a great picture of this. Uh, we're having Baptism Sunday again on April 14th. And, and I want you to know, like, when we do baptism, if I ask somebody, like, if I'm talking to somebody in town, I'll be like, so what do you think baptism is? They'll be like, that's when you get dunked, right? Like, that's just like... But it's really deeper than that. Baptism, when you go under the water, you are showing that your old life is dead. And you're leaving it behind and you're rising to a new life in Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's a symbolic picture of what we're talking about, of radically changed life that was caused, brought about by the resurrection. So here's point number two. The resurrection breathes new love into our relationships. Now, some people are not going to like this one, but it's okay. All right, it's okay. We're going to press forward. When we, when we embrace the resurrection, when Jesus comes in our heart and begins to change us, we love differently. We no longer have to win every time. We no longer have to get our way every time. Okay? Uh, when I counsel people, sometimes I have to counsel people who are non-believers. And sometimes it's exhausting to me because... We'll be going in circles like, well, he never does what I want him to do, and she never does what I want to do. And I'm like, well, somebody's going to have to get over themselves. Somebody's going to have to meet Jesus and realize it's not about you. Like at some point, or we're just going to dance because it's not. And so we begin to love differently when, when Jesus begins his work in us and when the resurrection begins to change us. We forgive differently. Some people I've seen forgive things, and you would think, how in the world could they forgive that? I tell you, they didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did it in them. The Holy Spirit did it in them. They couldn't do it. No one could do that, but God can. And so when we forgive and we bear with each other's faults, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And here's another one that's not very popular in Morgan County. We begin to view others differently. We begin to see value in all people, whether or not we deem them worthy. All right? So listen, this is Morgan County, but let's go ahead. Let's just throw it out there. Listen, guys, there is no room in the Scriptures anywhere for you to walk with Jesus and be racist. 
It's not in there. And I have so many conversations, and I'm trying to help people. My friends at the Mexican restaurant blow me away. They tell me all the time, they're like, people are mean to us. And I'm like, what? Like, everybody eats here. And they're like, yeah. It's like, they will tell us verbally, we like your food, but we don't like you. But people have no shame. I'd be like, did you give them a loogie? <laughs> Can we edit that out from the live stream, please? I don't know. Oh, I'm gonna try. But I'm just saying, guys, there's no room for that. And so when I have conversations, I'm like, Jesus wasn't white. Let's start here. Adam and Eve were not white, all right? Let's just start here. What? Yeah, right? So it's like, I don't understand. So we've got to understand. We begin to see others differently. And listen, it's real easy. It's real easy to, for us to say, well, they look like me, talk like me, dress like me, like the same stuff I do. Okay, I'll hang out with them. But even lost people do that. Even the world does that. We have to learn to love like Jesus loved. So we begin, when the Holy Spirit begins to work in us, that's what he does. And he says in John 14, he says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, an advocate, to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And so the word here the, for the helper and advocate is called the paraclete. And it was a Greek word that meant a helper, an encourager, or a friend who comes alongside and helps you, helps you keep going. And so the Holy Spirit now lives in us to empower us and to guide us and to help us to move forward. What a, what a comfort that is. And that's all because of the resurrection. And when I think about this, you know, when I do premarital counseling, and me and my wife, we tell people all the time, like, it is not your love for each other that will keep you married. Because there's days you don't like each other. There's days when you will fall out of love. It's your love for Jesus and her love for Jesus that keeps us faithful. Okay, it's because I can't, I do not want to look for another woman because that would dishonor the God I serve, the God I love. And, it, and that's besides my wife and my children. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not being arrogant. No one's above temptation. Listen, the wrong moment, the wrong time, the wrong temptation, everyone in here will fall. So let's just call a spade a spade, all right? I'm not being holier than that. I'm just saying it is our love for Jesus and our relationship with Jesus that makes things go, that makes things function, that makes it different in our lives. So here's number three. Point number three, the resurrection breathes new power into our choices. So before, you know, before we have the Holy Spirit in us, before we embrace the resurrection, uh, we, we are trapped in sin. We are powerless against sin. Um, but it says the resurrection paved the way for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to equip believers and empower us to have victory over sin, to, to be able to serve God, to be able to carry on His work in this world, to equip us and empower us. And, and it's, such a, it's such a beautiful and important thing that we understand, but so many times uh, we don't really think about it. We don't live in it, and we just live. We keep going back to doing the same old things we used to do, but we don't have to anymore. We really don't. I love this verse in Philippians 2.13. says this, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. So he's working in you, he's stirring you, he's helping you, like so that we can live a life that honors him, and that is all because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last point, point number four. The resurrection breathes victory over death. First Corinthians says this, verse uh, chapter 15 says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory. Death no longer has to be scary. It can feel scary. It doesn't have to be. Second Corinthians, a lot of people ask me as a pastor, they'll be like, so what happens after I die? Like, what happens after you die? And I'll say, well, it really depends on who you are. Okay. Because the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so when we die, your body's going to go on the earth, but your spirit's going to heaven. And then from there, it all depends on what you've done with Jesus. Have you given your life to Christ? Have you put your faith in him? Because I'm going to tell you right now, like if you, you know, my daughter asked me a while back. She was like, Dad, what are the sins that keep you out of heaven? And I said, actually, honey, it has nothing to do with the sins has to do with whether or not you put your faith in Jesus. And that's hard for humans to gra grapple with. We want to be able to check a box. We want to be able to feel like we earned it. But really, it has nothing to do with that. 
And so if we have turned from our sins and put our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we have believed and said, I believe, Jesus, you're the Son of God, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, and I believe you were buried and rose again on the third day. If we put our faith in that, and we ask him to save us and change us, then we will go to heaven to be with him. If we don't do that, if we reject him, then we will go to hell. And right now, you're probably, there's people in here right now thinking, are you really going to talk about hell? I mean, we got our pastel colors on. You know, we're going to dye some eggs. Like, we're happy. But I can't miss this opportunity to tell someone their house is on fire. Some of you in here, your house is on fire. And it'd be good to put it out. We don't need to fear death anymore. So here's my challenge today. Two challenges. Number one, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you're a believer, a Christian, I don't like to use the word Christian a lot because in the South, everybody's a Christian. In the South, if you're born in the South, you're a Christian. I, I, I mean, like, if you have put your faith in Jesus and you try to follow him, that's who I'm talking to, okay? If that's you today, then, I, then your, your soul and your heart is already alive. So now I'm going to speak to, are there areas in your life that you are trying to keep off limits to God? Are there areas like, God, you can have all of me except this right here? Because I want you to know that until you give him all of it, those areas will struggle. Because he does everything better than we do, all right? You want to be a good dad? Don't try to do it on your own. I learned that. He can do it better. You want to be a good spouse? Don't try to do it on your own. He can do it better. All right? You want to be a good role model? You want to fight sin? Don't try to do it on your own. He can do it better. And so my challenge to you, if you're a follower of Jesus today, my challenge is like whatever areas you're, you have that you kind of keep in art, like give them to him, surrender them to him. Because everywhere that he walks, there's life. So let him bring life right into it. And it will flourish. Now, my other challenge are for those in here who are not believers. You've never put your faith in Christ. Some people in here may have never heard the gospel and never knew to all this. Well, my challenge to you would be simply turn from your sins and turn to Jesus. Put your faith in Him. And you may say, well, Chris, well, how do I do that? Well, I'll tell you right now. Is that if you, if you are ready and willing to pray and call out to God and turn from your sins and turn to Him, He is ready and willing to forgive you, to wipe away your past, to embrace you no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're from. His grace is good enough. And He will save you and forgive you and change you. He's willing, but we have to be willing to do our part. So we're going to have a, a song of response right now. And, and I'm going to be very clear. Carl, would you come on up, Brother Carl? I want to be very clear just so everybody knows what's going on here. We're going to have a song of response. If you need to pray, if you've got something in your heart, maybe a family issue, a job issue, something at home, health, whatever, anything going on that you want to pray to God, the front is open. You're welcome to come pray privately. No one is going to bother you. We may, they may pray beside you or over you, but they're not going to talk to you, not going to ask you stuff, but you don't have to carry your burden alone. Okay. If you need someone to lay hands on you, like you are really struggling, Brother Carl's going to be right over here. He leads our prayer ministry. He will lay hands on you and pray with you. So if you need that today, go to him. I'm going to be standing right over here. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, I will gladly talk with you through it. And here's what I'll do. If you come to me, I will talk to you. I'll pray with you, and I'll give you a booklet, and then I'll let you go back to your seat. That's what will happen. So now that we're clear, let's all stand. Let's worship, and let's respond however God leads you to do.
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life was born. Jesus is calling.
love our, to hear our voices. Sing this one more time. Sing, oh, what a Savior. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We just want to celebrate um, this morning service. We had one salvation. We just had four salvations today. Yep. And so, so excited. I can tell you right now, April 14th, baptism Sunday is going to be off the hook. All right. You don't want to miss it. Um, man, I'm just fired up now. Had to get your fire going. Your wood's wet. That's right. That's right. Hey, guys, I just want to say thank you for being here. I want to share a few things uh, for those that are regular so you can know about it. And if you're new, you're welcome to jump into any of these. You're, everybody's invited. Um, April 14th is our 10th birthday party. Uh, we're celebrating that. We're going to have a big meal. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. God's, God's already done more than we could ask or possibly imagine. Right now, now it's just all grace from here, man. That's just, I'm just going along. All right. Um, so we're going to be celebrating that. It's also Baptism Sunday, April 14th. Um, April 18th through 20th is our marriage retreat. Um, we already have 32 couple sign up. It's going to be huge this year. Um, so if you want to go, sign up on the app. Uh, get your spot. It's going to be great. And then um, I don't have a slide for it, but our student camp is coming up the first week of July. Um, it's going to be a great time. Our student ministry is amazing. Our student leaders are awesome. Uh, they're going to be taking the kids to, I think it's at Newport. It's like right outside somewhere. No, I'm looking at you. Is it Newport? You don't know. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to, it's huge. It's going to be awesome camp. Um, and so if you have a sixth grade to 12th grade child student, you want to definitely try to get them in there. It's going to be an amazing time. That said, I hope you have an amazing Easter today. I hope that you eat and play and laugh and enjoy family and friends and all the good gifts of God that come from above. Amen. Volunteer or a kids flow? Well, they said uh, kids flow. Kristen, just pick up regular. Okay, you go in the barn door, and then you go out the white door. That's what I missed last service. Okay, I didn't understand. You go in the barn, out. Okay, there you go. We Perfect. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you again. Um, just thankful for your goodness. Thankful for um, your faithfulness towards us. We pray that you um, fill us this week with your spirit so we can be a light. Help us to live I'm in the resurrection. And so we love you. We thank you. 